So, and anytime I've got a handout, I'll put it down here in the front. Did anybody not get a handout? Everybody's got one? Handouts are good. Here we go, Erica Page. Okay. I'm not going to mooch food off my students, no matter how dapper they might be with their bow ties and nose rings. That's pretty an awesome conversation. <laughs> okay. So, does anybody have any questions from what we covered last time? We went over, um, how far did we get? Tell me what we finished up on last time. You tell me. Huh? We're talking about different types of claims. So we talked about frequency claims, correlational claims, and causal claims, right? We talked about the different types of validity, which were construct validity, internal, external, and statistical. Okay, does anybody have any questions about any of those things right now, or are we okay to move on to our next topic? Anything that as you were looking at or thinking about it, you were confused and need me to clarify? We're good? For the most part, that should be stuff you've seen before, so it should not be there. Okay. But if you have questions, let me know. All right. So today we're going to start talking about experiments. And we're going to talk about what about different structures of experiments. And different, when I say structures, I mean ways to design experiments to do certain kinds of comparisons. So first of all, just to link it to our discussion of different types of claims, experiments are designed in general to make causal claims. If you're doing a true experiment, then what you're trying to do is establish a causal relationship between the changes in the independent variable, which you created, and any observed changes in the dependent variable which is what you're measuring. Now, remember that our requirements for a causal relationship are you have to have a correlation between the variables, right, or covariance. Okay, they have to covary. You have to have a time order relationship, clear directionality. Changes in the independent variable have to occur before changes in the dependent variable are observed. Your book refers to this as temporal precedence, which I think is a really fancy way of saying something has to come before something else in time. Right? The IV has to change before the DV changes. That's what temporal precedence means. Thirdly, we've got correlation, time order relationship, and then we have to have an absence of third variables, meaning that we have to be sure that there's no other variable that could be causing the changes in the dependent variable besides our beloved independent variable. Okay. And experiments were designed with this in mind. Experiments are designed for control freaks. Experiments are all about control. We're trying to eliminate any other possible explanation for changes in the dependent variable except the independent variable, if we can. And we do that by trying to hold things constant or balancing things across conditions that we can't hold constant. So as an example, before I talked about doing a study with rats, or I would give them injections of testosterone in varying amounts, and would look to see if how much testosterone they received was connected to or related to how aggressive they were subsequently. So if I'm doing a study on rats, there are some variables that, I'm not, that are not the testosterone I'm injecting with and are not their level of aggression that I need to think about. For example, it could be because male rats already have a higher level of testosterone in their system than female rats, but they're naturally more aggressive. So that being the case, I need to be concerned about the sex of the rats in my study. Sex is a variable, right? It manifests in different ways in the environment. Typically, it manifests as male and female. Okay. 
So I have a choice. I can either hold sex constant or I can balance it across the different conditions in my study. So say my independent variable has three levels. Low level of testosterone, moderate level of testosterone, and high level of testosterone, just to be general. So if I'm going to hold sex constant in my study, I'm either going to do my study all on female rats or all on male rats. Now I'm going to take that thing that could be a variable, male or female, and I'm going to eliminate all manifestations of that variable in my study except for one. So I'm going to turn it into a constant. So if I do my study on all female rats or all male rats, I'm holding sex constant. That's one way that I can control whether the sex of the rat, and by virtue of that, their baseline level of testosterone contributes to my study. Because I want to know for sure that it's the testosterone I'm injecting into them that's causing any change. Because that's what I have control over. Now, the alternative, if I can't hold something constant, because maybe for some weird reason I don't have enough of one sex of rat. Well, it's hard to imagine that, but with people, it's happened a lot. So I don't have enough of one sex of rat, or I think I want to know about both sex of rat, so sexes of rat. So I decide that I'm going to balance male and female rats across the conditions. What that means is I'm going to make sure that when I assign rats to the different conditions in my study, I'm going to make sure that the low testosterone condition has the same number of male rats as the moderate testosterone condition, and that both of those have the same number of male rats as the high testosterone condition. So every condition is going to have the same number of male rats. Similarly, each one of those levels of testosterone is going to have the same number of female rats. So I'm balancing it out. So every condition, yes, it might have male and female rats, but the proportions are the same for every case. So that now, if sex does matter with regard to aggression, it's going to affect each condition the same, so it doesn't matter anymore. It's basically a wash. So it might be that male rats are more aggressive, but they're going to be more aggressive in every condition, so it doesn't matter. So I've got the choice. I can either manipulate the variable, which is what I'm doing with my independent variable. I'm manipulating it, controlling it as much as I possibly can. And then for variables, aside from my dependent variable, I have the choice of holding them constant or balancing them across conditions to try and eliminate other possible explanations for changes in my dependent variable. Now, all experiments have covariance and directionality. That's just the way it goes. Where experiments vary, is in how much control the researcher has over the independent variable. If the researcher truly controls that independent variable, meaning that the researcher is able to randomly assign subjects to different levels of that variable, or randomly order those conditions how subjects are exposed to them, so they're able to randomly assign it, mix it up, then we say that that independent variable is a manipulated variable, and we have a true experiment. If, on the other hand, the independent variable represents a naturally existing set of groups, so for example, if I wanted to compare Republicans and Democrats and socialists and independents. Okay? Those are naturally existing groups in the world, not in the rat population probably, but um, in the people population. There are these different political groups. Those are naturally existing groups. As a researcher, I don't get to say to you when you come into my study, I'm randomly assigning you to be a Democrat today. I'm randomly assigning you to be a Republican today. I'm randomly assigning you to be an independent today. You are what you are when you walk in the door. So we refer to that as a subject variable. It reflects a pre-existing state or experience or condition that the subject has. And that's why the subject got chosen for the study. Because they already had that state. They already belonged to some group that the researcher wants to look at. Sometimes these uh, subject variables are referred to as individual differences variables because they reflect actual differences among individuals in the world. 
do you identify as black? Do you identify as white? Do you identify as Latino? Do you identify as Chinese? You know, what, what's your identity? Um, or we call them natural group variables because again, they reflect naturally existing groups in the world. If you have a subject variable, then you've got a quasi-experimental design. And if you've got a quasi-experimental design, you cannot make a causal claim because your independent variable is weak with regard to control. Because let's just think about it. Say we were going to compare people who identify as Republican versus people who identify as Democrat versus people who identify as independent. Now, it's true that people in those three groups vary in terms of their political identity. But how many other ways do you think people in those groups vary? <laughs> I mean, how different do you think people who identify as Republican are from people who identify as Democrat? What ways might they be different besides how they identify? Social status. Social status, right? How much money they make. Republicans tend to make more money than Democrats. Religiosity. Religiosity. Republicans tend to be more religious than Democrats. Race. Race could be. We tend to see more white Republicans and more minority Democrats. What else? So, now, can you imagine that if you're doing a study where you're comparing different political ideologies, that things like how much money you make and your race and your religiosity might affect your behavior too? Yeah, definitely. So you can't control those things, right? You can't hold religiosity constant. You can't balance it across conditions. You can't hold race constant. You can't balance it across conditions. You can't hold class constant. You can't balance it across conditions. Well, it's really hard to do if what you're interested in is their political affiliation. So with every one of those categories, with Republican comes a bundle of things. And with Democrat comes a bundle of things that you can't control. And you don't know if it's their democraticness or some other characteristic that they have that's leading them to think certain things. They might say, yeah, I'm a Democrat. But what kind of Democrat? I mean, I know some very religious Democrats who, you know, are really into helping the poor and, you know, whatever. So, yeah. Well, couldn't you hold something like that constant, but the problem would be it wouldn't be generalizable? Right. So you can try and hold it constant, but then it's not really reflecting the group anymore. Oh, yeah. Right? Because those groups are naturally diverse in other ways. And if you're trying to, so by increasing the external validity and holding things constant, you decrease the, or by, by holding, the, making the internal validity better, you make the external validity worse, right? It's always a trade-off. And if you're looking at naturally existing groups, chances are you're really interested in external validity. But it means your internal validity is going to be weaker. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So association claims are quasi experiences. Mm -hmm. You bet. And they just can't make, or they're going to be, yeah, they're going to be association claims. Quasi, or I guess the better way to put it would be quasi-experimental studies are making association claims that people really want to read as causal claims because they're experiments, but they can't really say that because there's too many things that are controlled. They don't meet that third criteria. Does that make sense? They have the first two, a covariance and time order relationship, but they don't have the, um, they don't have the uh, absence of third variable. So it's just, the best we can say is that it's associative. So just as a checklist, manipulated variables are created. Subject variables are selected. Okay. In a manipulated variable, when you have a manipulated variable, the researcher identifies what values they want for the IV. They create conditions that correspond to those values. And then they can randomly assign the subjects to whichever condition they want. Every subject that comes into the study has an equal chance of being in any of the conditions. Okay? So, for example, if I'm administering dosages of testosterone to rats, every, any rat that is going to be in my study has an equal chance of being in the low group, the moderate group, or the high group. Alternately, if I'm doing a study where subjects are experiencing more than one condition, I can randomly order the way in which they experience those conditions. So I have to be able to randomize the subject's exposure to the conditions for an independent variable to be manipulated. If I can't, 
if it's not possible for me to say every single subject in my study had an equal chance of being in every group, then I'm working with the subject variables, okay, a pre-existing state. So someone walks into my lab, I can't say, okay, today you're a native speaker of Japanese. Because if they're not, I can't randomly assign them to that. It doesn't work that way. So when I'm comparing, for example, monolingual speakers of Japanese to bilingual speakers of Japanese and looking at how they differ in terms of how they read, I don't get to decide whether they're monolingual or bilingual. They're just in my study because I selected them because these people are monolingual and these people are bilingual. So they are pre-existing in that state and I have to take who I can get. So let's think about that for a second. How might people who are monolingual in Japanese be different than people who are bilingual in Japanese and English? Besides how many languages they speak. Just to think about the things I can't control. Where they're from. Where they're from. Right? Because somebody who's monolingual in Japanese probably <laughs> from Japan. Right? Now they're not necessarily Japanese, but chances are they're they're born and raised in Japan, right? And they're very, very likely to be ethnically Japanese. Okay. Um, what are some other ways that they might be different? Yeah. How they know the language? Yep, so someone who's bilingual in English and Japanese might not know either language as well as a monolingual speaker to some degree, right? Because if they switch, like, uh, people I know who are bilingual often speak one language at home and another language in another environment. So their vocabularies, I mean, they can talk in both languages quite well, but what they talk about is quite different. Does that make sense? Okay. What else? Educational differences. Educational differences could be people who are monolingual, might have different access to education than people who are bilingual, right? They could come from different socioeconomic groups, um, have different exposure to people from other countries and cultures, right? If you're bilingual, chances are you interact on a regular basis with people who are monolingual in each of the languages you use, right? You have more exposure to diversity than if you're monolingual. Chances are you interact only with people who speak that one language who are much more likely to be just like you. Um, you might have, so if you have a broader cultural experience, you might have different vocabulary because you may want to talk in English about things in Japanese culture and in Japanese about things in American culture, as an example. Whereas a Japanese person might not even know words for some things in American culture because they don't exist in Japanese culture, or vice versa. So there's lots of things you can't control when you've got a subject variable. And that's why. I can never make a causal claim and say speaking two languages causes people to read this way. Speaking one language causes them to read this way. Because there's so many other things that could be guiding how they read, aside from the number of languages that they speak. So when we do an experiment, at minimum, we need an independent variable and a dependent variable. The independent variable must have at least two levels, because that's as little as it can vary. The dependent variable will typically have many, many more levels, lots and lots of units, because the dependent variable is typically measured on an interval or ratio scale. Independent variables are very often measured on nominal and ordinal scales. Now, do you guys remember the difference between all these different kinds of scales? What's a nominal scale? <laughs> just names, right? Nom, name, right? Just names, just categories. Okay? They can go in any order, doesn't matter. So if I say Democrat, Republican, Independent, Socialist, that's a perfectly good order, but so is Socialist, Republican, Independent, Democrat. Those are all, doesn't matter. Okay? They're just names of groups. Now, if we move up one level in complexity from nominal scales, we get to ordinal. What do ordinal scales have that nominal scales don't? Order. Order, right? Ordinal order. Okay? So they have rank order. So freshman, sophomore, junior, senior is ordinal. Right? Nice personality, cute, hot, yes, please. <laughs> okay? That's, a, that's an ordinal scale of attraction. Now, the thing about ordinal skills is we don't know 
the distance between the units. Because freshmen could be, you know, they could have no credits. They could have more credits, right? We don't know how many years they've been in school. Sometimes people are freshmen for a long time. Sometimes they're seniors for a long time, right? We don't know the distance between them. If I talk about nice personality, cute, hot, and yes, please, what's the difference between those? Is cute as far away from hot as cute is from nice personality? No, different. But, but how much? We don't know, right? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And what one person thinks is hot, someone else is like, oh, I don't think so. Right? So it's, ordinal scales have order, but we don't, all we know is that about that order. We don't know how close the categories are together or how broad how much room they cover. If five people finish a race, you know, the person who comes in first could come in a tenth of a second faster than the person in second. The person in second could come in a full second faster than the person in third, but it's still first, second, and third, right? Even though the distance between them is quite different in terms of time. Interval scale. What does an interval scale have that an ordinal scale doesn't have? Numbers. Numbers, yes? Not yet. That's ratio. That's ratio, but you're, you're on the right track. They have, an interval scale has intervals in that they have fixed units, right? So each mark on the scale is the same distance away from the mark above and below it. And we know how much that a unit of measurement is. So if I'm talking about degrees Fahrenheit, I know that 36 degrees is one degree warmer than 35 degrees and one degree cooler than 37 degrees and that degree difference is a known amount and the two differences are the same because a degree is a degree is a degree so there's a known interval ratio scales have a true zero interval scales have an arbitrary zero so zero degrees fahrenheit doesn't mean it's as cold as it can get zero degrees fahrenheit we can still get we can get it to negative 10 negative 20 negative 30, right? It can still get colder. So zero degrees Fahrenheit is not really zero. It's arbitrary. That's why zero degrees Fahrenheit is different than zero degrees Celsius, because zero doesn't really mean zero. Now, if you get to Kelvin scale, zero really means zero, because at zero degrees Kelvin, there is no more heat. Nothing's moving. Molecules are not moving. Everything is totally frozen. At zero grams, something doesn't weigh anything, right? You can't, something can't weigh less than zero grams. I guess you can talk about milligrams, but it can't get down. You can get it as small as you want, but at some point, there is zero. That really means this has no weight. Of course, there's nothing in the world that actually has no weight. So, independent variables are typically on nominal and ordinal scales. Dependent variables are typically on interval and ratio scales. Now you see this thing here that says almost interval scales. You guys know what an almost interval scale is? It's an ordinal scale that the researchers are treating like an interval scale because interval scales you can do math on. Like what's the average of, if you have five cutes and three nice personalities, what's the average of that? slightly cuter than nice personality, right? But what does it even mean, right? Because we don't know what different people are rating as cute and what different people are rating as nice personality. Some people are really obnoxious when it comes to those kind of judgments, right? They're like, unless you look like superstar, fabulous, model, TV star, whatever, then you're like, no. Or unless you look like super bodybuilder of doom, no. <laughs> huh? Huh? Yeah, I thought it was funny when you said bodybuilder of doom. Yeah, it, it was fun. It was hysterical. All right, so what's the average of that? We don't know. But you've all heard of Likert scales, right? Things like strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. Well, what's the average of five agrees and three strongly agree? I don't know even how you would do the math on that. But if you say strongly agree is five, and agree is four, and neutral is three, and disagree is two, and strongly disagree is one, now all of a sudden you can turn those 
ordinal values into numbers and start doing math on them. And this is why people in non-social sciences say that social sciences are soft science because sometimes our numbers are squishy. Because what does a 3.5 mean on that scale? Um, it means halfway between, the average response was halfway between neutral and agree. What does that mean? Like what is, what is that value? Is it neutral or is it agree? It's almost agree? People almost agree with this statement? What does that mean? But that's what the math says. So the numbers don't really mean numbers when it comes to almost interval scales. But social scientists love to use almost interval scales, especially psychologists, because we want to ask people about their beliefs and their attitudes and their feelings and their experiences. And there's no way to ask about those in hard quantitative ways, or it's hard to do that. Because you want to know how people feel about something. And you want to measure it and you want to compare how different groups feel about this and this and this. How are you going to assess that without some of these squishy numbers? So dependent variables in psychology can sometimes be on this almost interval scale, where we're basically taking ordinal scale and then treat it like an interval scale so we can do math on it. It's a little bit of cheating. Now, in an experiment, every condition represents either a treatment or a control. Okay? So we've got a treatment is going to be some something that we're doing to the subject. And in a control, we're typically not doing something subject. Now, it's not the case that all controls are the same. There's actually lots of different kinds of controls. I'll talk to you about several, four different kinds of controls we're going to address in this class. The first kind that you've probably heard about before is something called a no treatment control. And this is literally where we do nothing to the subjects in that group. We don't treat them in any way. We don't do anything out of the ordinary. We just gather data on the dependent variable from the subjects in their everyday regular state. So for example, if I were comparing rats who got no testosterone to rats who got an injection of testosterone, that group that got no testosterone, and I just measured how many times they aggressed against other rats in the colony in a one hour period. Um, that would be a no treatment control. I didn't do anything to them. I'm just using it as the baseline. How much do rats normally try to bite each other? Because I need to know that so that I can compare it to the ones that got testosterone to see if they're biting each other more than rats normally do. Then I can say, hey, the only difference between these two groups is that this group didn't get any testosterone, and this group did. And this group's biting 50% more. So now I can say, if I control everything else, that the testosterone made the rats more aggressive, made them more bitey. That's a no treatment control. A standard treatment control is where withholding treatment, okay, doing no treatment, would actually be a problem. So for example, if I am a clinician and I'm working in a mental health facility and I've got patients who are all diagnosed with major depressive disorder people are all sick and they need help and they came to me to get help because they're so depressed that they can't manage it on their own. Well, it would be unethical of me to say, okay, so we're going to uh, study a new drug for treating depression, but you can't have it. You can't have anything because I'm going to do a you and no treatment control. So I'm going to make you sit there and get no help. You just have to sit in your room by yourself, getting depressed. That's wrong, right? These people are coming, trying to get help, and I'm just like, no, you can't have it. <laughs> no help for you. That'd be wrong. So instead, at the very least, the very least I can do is make sure that these individuals get some therapy, right? some kind of therapy. Let's say talk therapy. So. The very least I can do is make sure that they get a standard treatment, a known and established treatment that's proven effective, that we know how it works, we know it's time course of effectiveness, we have a good idea of what the treatment manifests as in the world, 
And so that's going to be my baseline because no treatment is wrong. So I will give them a treatment that I know works, but that isn't anything new. So nothing new. Then another group might get that therapy plus a drug to see if that drug as an experimental condition actually improves the effectiveness of the therapy for addressing depression. So I could have standard treatment control and then my experimental group would get the same thing plus a drug. Alternately, I could have a standard treatment therapy and the other group might get only a drug. That could also be an experimental condition in that case, comparing talk therapy to medication only as a response to depression. So standard treatment means they are getting some treatment, but it's not a treatment I need to know more information about. I'm just getting data as a baseline. Then there's placebo control. That's where my subjects in the group think they're, that's where they think they're getting a treatment, but they're not. Typically it's a, some kind of drug treatment. So I could have a study where I have one group that's getting talk therapy, Another group that's getting a placebo, they're getting a pill that they think is a drug, but it's not. Now, again, because it's not a drug, it would be unethical for me to just give them that placebo. So, because if, if they actually need help and I'm just giving them a placebo, I think, well, what's a placebo? It's something that's not supposed to do anything, right? Except psychologically help them. Then, in that case, I would probably have to have standard treatment control of therapy and a placebo control group with therapy and the placebo, so that at least I can be sure that they're getting the basic therapy to address their mental health issues. Then I could have a third group that had talk therapy plus a new drug that's actually a drug. And that would allow me to compare for my three groups how effective the drug plus talk therapy is compared to thinking you're taking a drug plus talk therapy because there is a component to depression and other kinds of recovery where thinking that you're doing something to help helps you get better, right? Making a choice to try and get better helps. And so we want to see how much does the placebo, just thinking you're taking a drug, how much does that help you improve? And then compare that to the standard treatment control of just getting talk therapy. So a study can have multiple controls. I mean, I could potentially have no treatment control, a standard treatment control, and a placebo control in the study, in addition to an experimental group. Totally in jail. Now, a list control, kind of interesting case. A list control is where I'm going to do a study, and I want to have a no treatment control condition, but I really shouldn't or at least not permanently. So as an example, let's say that uh, I have patients with Alzheimer's disease. Okay. I've got a group of patients who have Alzheimer's disease, and I want to know if this new medication will slow <coughs> down their symptoms of dementia. Well, I'm, we'll get their legal representatives to volunteer the individuals for the study, and some people in my study are going to get this new medication, but I need to have a group to compare them to that doesn't get any medication so I can have a sense of the natural time course of the dementia for people in this group, this age group, racial group, socioeconomic group, whatever I'm interested in. Now, it would be wrong for me to withhold that kind of treatment for a long period of time, but I can wait list it. So I could say, we're going to give people this medication for three months, and we're going to see if their dementia symptoms slow down. At the time, that's going to be our experimental group. We're going to have a wait list control group where for those three months, they're not going to receive this medication. Because there's lots of people with Alzheimer's who don't take any medication at all. So a treatment is not required. I could say, so for three months, we're not going to give them any medication. And then we're going to look and see how the two groups differ. But when the study is over, then this group that served as a no treatment control group for us in this study will then have the opportunity to get the treatment if they want it. So if the treatment proves to be effective, they'll get the same option 
that the people in the other group got. Does that make sense? So we wait list them. We basically wait to give them treatment until we've gathered no treatment data from them. And then we give them the option. Yeah. So the first time when you're doing the treatment, the wait list control would be like your just your no regular treatment. control. Yeah. No. And then when, when the study's over, you give them treatment. And we don't gather any data from them at that point. So that treatment that you would give, would that be available to everybody or would that just be available to that group and that would be a second round? Um, no, we probably wouldn't want to gather data from them at that point because we don't know what the three month delay might have done. Okay. So what we're, what we're saying is that if you're willing to wait and we don't have evidence that waiting is inherently bad, so we're not doing harm by withholding treatment, we can, we will give you the same treatment because when they volunteer, they don't know whether they're going to get weightless controlled or in the experimental group. So. Um, we don't want them to feel that they're not receiving a benefit that the other group is getting. So the idea is we will give you the same benefit that the other group gets, but we just want you to wait. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about these different kinds of controls? Yes, Sean. Um, so what about, uh, have you seen Dallas Fires Club? No. Uh, well, it's just about it's tree. Right. Um, well, it's just about people, uh, like a group of people with AIDS getting treatment, um, and they wait the list. <laughs> or something? No. Well, yeah, that too. But uh, like in the actual study, they're doing a study, and they're trying this new drug out, and they wait list half the people by giving them a placebo. Mm -hmm. it, um, would that not be OK today? Well, so if you know that withholding treatment will cause harm, if there's solid evidence that it will cause harm, that would be unethical. So right now we know that if you administer certain treatments very early, that can actually, I mean, it's, there, there are some cases where, and they're rare, but some cases where people have literally, they seem to have recovered, right? Where they can live for a very long period of time with the right regimen of medicine. And by withholding drugs for some period of time, their immune system can actually get so bad off that they can't recover. So I think we know more about how HIV progresses now and how AIDS progresses now, mm -hmm. that it would be less likely to do that. We're more interested in now trying to see how long people can live. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's a different world with regard to that. But if you know, for example, that it's not going to hurt, then, and that a delay, you know, for example, say you're looking at a weight loss study. As long as you're talking about people who aren't physically in danger, horrible danger. I mean, putting off a diet for three months, I do that like every two months. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I should start exercising more. When it gets cooler. <laughs> oh, now it's cold outside. I'll wait till it warms up. <laughs> now it's now it's wet outside. I'll wait till it's drier, right? So you know there are people who could start Weight Watchers right now, but they could also wait three months and it probably wouldn't be the end of the universe. And there's a reason to think that people's weight. Say we're looking at people participating in a known diet, different diet plans over the course of six months. Mm -hmm. well, we expect people's weight naturally to fluctuate, right? People naturally get more lean as the weather gets warmer, and they tend to get a little bit softer and squishier as the weather gets colder. And part of that's because as the weather gets nicer, people spend more time engaging in outdoor activities. Also, the kinds of foods that are available tend to be healthier foods. And when you think about when the weather gets colder, what do we do? We sit inside and eat lots of food, right? Think about the cold, cold weather holidays. Those are like just candy, cake, and turkey, and everything you can imagine galore, right? And it's everywhere you go, right? I mean, you have to work out like an extra two hours a day because, and, you know, an extra two hours a day for me is two hours more than I ever do. <laughs> so, I'm just kidding, it's not really that bad. But, um, 
but you, we know there's going to be those natural fluctuations. So you might want to have a weightless control group under those circumstances so you can see what natural changes in weight would be normal for this particular group of people. And then you can subtract that information out from the effectiveness of any of the diet plans because you can say, okay, well, if I see weight loss between January and June, is that the diet or is that just that people tend to get outside and exercise more and eat healthier food as more fresh fruits and vegetables become available? Because what vegetables are you eating in winter? Potatoes. And more potatoes with cream and butter and gravy on them, right? And some more potatoes, right? He's like, I know. Why do you think I do Zumba? Like <laughs> all the potatoes in the world. You just have potatoes. He said, like, like, you're eating crackers. I'm like, I just want to eat sleeper crackers. <laughs> oh, I have to become a Zumba instructor. Oh, okay, I guess I'll just avoid the sleeper crackers. I'm so jealous. He's got delicious food. You've got delicious food. You guys are torturing me. It's lunch. Okay. All right. So when we do an experiment, we're going to do comparisons that allow it. We're talking about a single independent variable that allow us to make comparisons between subjects or within subjects. A between subjects comparison is when we compare totally non-overlapping groups of subjects. So if I'm comparing two groups, nobody, and I've got group A and group B, nobody in group A is in group B. There's no overlap. So I'm comparing the difference between these two totally different groups of subjects. And within subjects design, there's total overlap between the groups. So I might have two groups, like the exercise group and the not exercise group, but everybody is in both groups. So we might gather data from them when they're not exercising and then gather data from them when they're exercising. So I've got both sets of data from the same group of people. That's a within subjects comparison. Now between subjects comparisons can also be called independent groups, independent measures, between groups, so all of those are interchangeable. Within subjects designs can also be called related groups, dependent groups, repeated measures, or related measures. So those are all interchangeable. The, the one constant is that between groups always means totally distinct groups of subjects are being compared. And within subjects means the same subjects are being compared in different ways. Now, in a between subjects design, we can have, I mean, there are different ways that between subjects can manifest. So you could have a random groups design, you can have a matched groups design, you can have a natural groups design. Okay? From left to right, random groups design, that's going to give you a true experiment. Random groups design means that you randomly assign the subjects to the group that they're in. So every subject had an equal shot of being in any group. If I do that, then chances are individual differences among my subjects are going to be balanced across the conditions, and I don't have to worry about those individual differences being threats to my internal validity. In a natural groups design, I can't randomly assign because they're naturally existing groups. It's a subject variable. The idea is a subject variable. So I'm definitely talking quasi-experimental because I might be comparing males and females. And we all know, if you compare males and females, I mean, yeah, males are X, Y, and females are X, X. But how many other ways are males and females different than that genetic difference? Like a billion. Okay. So um, they might be biologically different, but there's so many other ways that those groups are different that I'm definitely making a quasi-experimental design definitely not able to make a causal claim. Now, match groups designs are somewhere in the middle. A match group design is still going to involve random assignment. But before I do random assignment, I'm going to introduce some more control. I'm going to intervene in a way that I didn't intervene in the random groups design, because maybe I need to balance something across conditions that I, I'm not confident will get balanced well if I just do random assignment by itself. So because I'm worried about that third variable 
being a confound in my study, I'm actually going to intervene and match the subjects first before I randomly assign them to the conditions. And I'm going to show you in a minute an example that compares these two so you can see how we do that. Now the within subjects design, like I said, same subjects in every condition. Um, often, you know, we'll see longitudinal studies that are done like this when we compare somebody, you know, we the university gathers data about you guys when you're freshmen, when you're sophomores, when you're juniors, when you're seniors, and compares you to yourself, right? To look at different progress rates and things like that. That would be a within subjects comparison because you're getting compared to yourself. Um, but longitudinal studies, ones that take place over an extended period of time where the same subjects have data gathered from the multiple points in their lives, those are all within subject studies. Um, but any study where we have subjects uh, give us data points with regard to multiple conditions, we're talking about a within subject design. And we can distinguish between two kinds of within subject designs, complete versus incomplete designs. We'll talk about that <coughs> next time. Today we're going to focus on between subjects designs. So, what I'd like you to do now is take a look at the handout, which you very graciously picked up. standard treatment control, which is Purina 1, which is the, or Purina dog child, which is the most popular name brand dog food. And then we have our experimental group, the new, the fabulous Chunks and Lumps. This is a brand new food. We've been hired by the company that makes Chunks and Lumps to find, to do a taste test. You said, dogs prefer Chunks and Lumps. Four to three, or whatever. Okay. Well, how do they know that? People do studies like this where they feed animals different foods and look to see what they like better. Okay. So, we're going to do a study where the independent variable is dog food brand, where we've got three groups. And first, we're going to do random assignment. Okay. And we're going to use a technique called block randomization. You're going to learn how to do that in this class, and you'll be doing it on activities and on the test. So, make sure you pay attention. If you have any questions about how this works, let me know. All right, so here's the idea. Because this is an independent group's design, or between subjects design, each subject is only going to eat one food, right? Because the groups don't overlap. So the dogs that eat chunks and lumps never eat Kroger. They never eat Purina. The dogs that eat Purina never eat chunks. They never eat Kroger, so forth, okay? So each subject's only going to get one kind of food. Because I want to have a sample for each food, I want to have more than one dog. I want to make sure that I have an average for each group. I'm going to have multiple dogs eat in each category. But I'm going to randomly assign the dogs to their different food conditions using blocks. So how does this work? Well, first of all, let's think about the different conditions. We've got Chunks, Purina, and Kroger. And just for ease, we're going to refer to Chunks as A, and Purina as B, and Kroger as C. This is All right. So how many different <laughs> random orders are there of the things A, B, C? Nine. No, six. Six. There are six. What are they? A, B, C. What's another one? B, A, C. What's another one? CBA. CBA. Okay, what's another one? Good, you're, you found it on the chart, haven't you? Yes. What's the next one? BCA and CAB. Yes. Okay. So each one of these represents a block 
And a block is each of the orders one time. Okay. So when you have three conditions, there are six possible random orders of those three conditions. Okay. There are six possible orders. And we know that because we have three conditions and three factorial is three times two times one. So there's six possible random orders. If you had four conditions, how many possible random orders of four things would there be? Four times three times two times one. 24. Five things. Five times four times three times two times one. I don't expect you to be like that. I'm just saying. But that's how we know how many possible random orders there are. Now, you can see that I've listed the blocks here. And each different day of my study, since I've got blocks of three, so I've got three conditions, I'm going to have three dogs come in. And as they come in the door to my lab to try different food, I'm going to randomly assign them to one of the food conditions. So it just depends on when they walk in the door that I'm going to assign them given the block for that day. So on day one, I'm using the block A, B, C. That means that the first dog that comes in is going to go to Chunks, the second dog that comes in is going to go to Purina, and the third dog that comes in is going to go to Kroger. Okay, does that make sense? A, B, C. So the dogs come in your Rover, Fido, and Pumpkin. These are all names of actual George English Bulldog Rescue Bulldogs. Uh, so Rover, Fido, and Pumpkin come in, and they get assigned A, B, C. Chunks, Purina, Kroger. Okay. Day two. Buster, Chip, and Clarence come in. And it's never Clarence, it's always Clarence, because Clarence is a rascal. Okay. So Buster, Chip, and Clarence come in, and my block is B A C. That means that Buster is going to go into B. Right? So he's going to get Purina. Champ is going to go into A, so he's going to get chunks. And Clarence is going to go into C, so he's going to get. Kroger. Does that make sense? So this is block randomization. And every day I'm using a different random order and I'm making sure that I'm mixing it up so it's never that the first dog that comes in every day goes to Chunks and the second dog that comes in every day goes to Purina, the third dog that comes in every day goes to Kroger. Mixing it up because I don't know how the order in which they show up might be indicative of other differences between them. So I'm trying to mix it up as much as possible. So whatever differences might exist among these dogs, they will be distributed across my three conditions because it just depends when they walk in the door, <coughs> which group they get. So this is just simple block randomization. Now let's compare that to matching. Okay, so put your paper over. When we do matching, what we're doing is identifying a potential threat variable. And we're going to exert some control over it to keep it from causing a problem for our study. So it turns out male bulldogs actually vary a great deal in their weight, especially rescue dogs. Because rescue dogs have had a range of experience from maybe not being totally purebred because they're from backyard breeders. So some of them might have some boxer in them or some pit bull, so they might be bigger. Some dogs are really badly neglected, so they're extremely thin. Other dogs um, are very not neglected, and so they're really fat. I mean, I have seen some bulldogs come into rescue that literally look like marshmallows with a peg sticking out because they are so fat. They are so fat. And they can hardly walk. They're so fat, their legs get it. Because the people are like, oh, bulldogs are so cute when they're fat and he's always hungry. I'm like, a bulldog will always tell you he's hungry. Always. My dog Jazz was so lazy, he wouldn't even stand up while he was eating. Oh he put food in the bowl and he would lay down and put one arm on either side of the bowl and just stick his face in. Because he's like standing and eating his way too much work. You can probably tell why bulldogs are my favorite because we have very similar exercise patterns. <laughs> <laughs> so, unfortunately. All right, so, huh? 
I had come to play just go. <laughs> That's not what I do. That, that would be really unfortunate. No. I have a slightly better table manner than my bulldog Jeff. Yeah. Okay. He's a napkin. Huh? He's a napkin. <laughs> I use a napkin, yes. I cut one in and then I stick on it. <laughs> okay. So yeah, Jazz is number one for just like just like my dog Thor. Um, number one uh, job is to protect me from the couch attacking me. So we would sit right on it all day, making sure they did not leap up and bite me. They're very thoughtful that way. Bulldogs, great protectors. Okay. So dogs have really different weight. So for example, you can see Thor weighs over 70 pounds. That's the heaviest dog in my study. The lightest dog in my study is Jazz. These are both bulldogs that I have. Okay. Um, Thor I still have, Jazz was my first bulldog. And he only weighed 50 pounds, he was small, and that's typical, that's competition weight for a show quality bulldog. Man. So, and, so, you know, they vary a lot. And how big a dog is, is a threat to how much they eat. If I'm measuring how much of each food they eat, I care, because bigger dogs eat more because they're hungry. So I want to make sure that I distribute, I want to be sure that the weights of my dogs are evenly distributed across the different conditions in my study so they don't represent a threat. They don't represent a third variable that could explain why dogs in one group ate more than dogs in another group. Oh, if I accidentally get all of the big dogs in one condition and then that group eats more on average than another group, then someone can look at my data and say, yeah, but all the big dogs were in the chunks and lumps condition. That's why they ate more, because they're big. It's not because they like it more. It's because those dogs just eat more no matter what. You could feed them trash, and they would eat more. And some people do feed their dogs trash, which is kind of scary. Um, OK, so here's what I do. I'm going to look at this variable of weight, and I'm going to take all of my subjects, I'm going to rank order them either from highest to lowest or lowest to highest. It doesn't matter as long as I do it all in one order. And then I'm going to create groups. And each group, each matched group, these are the members of my subject group that are the most similar with regard to whatever this variable is. So for my first group in this study, I want to have the three heaviest dogs because they are similar and that they are all big, big, big boys. So I'm gonna put them in order. But where's the heaviest at 71 pounds? Toro is next at 70, and Buddy is next at 69. And then I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna create these groups. So I've shifted the color so you can see they go gray to white, gray to white, gray to white. So I've got group one has the three heaviest dogs, group two has the next three heaviest dogs, group three has the next three heaviest, and so on. Till I got them all organized into these matched groups. Now what I'm gonna do is make sure that one member from each matched group is in each of my food conditions. So now I'm gonna apply my blocks. So I did the matching, this is the matching procedure that puts them into groups. Okay, so the matching procedure gives us these groups. Now I'm gonna use these blocks to randomly assign members of the group to my different food conditions. So if Thor, Toro, and Buddy are my three heaviest dogs, I don't care what day they come in, and I don't care, you know, I don't, I don't care what order they come in. When Thor comes in, I'm randomly assigning him to group A. And when Toro comes in, I'm randomly assigning him to group B. And when Buddy comes in, I'm randomly assigning him to group C, because their block is A, B, C. When the dogs from group two come in, I don't care what day they come in, I don't care what order they come in. When Orvis comes in, he's going into group B. When Lewis comes in, he's going into group A. And when Champ comes in, he's going into group C, and so forth. So what I've done is I've matched them into groups, and then I do random assignment after that. And what happens when I do this is that the chunks group has one member from group one, one from group two, one from group three, one from group four, one from group five, and one from group six. So I've got a nice distribution of the range of weight in each condition. So now my average weight for each food condition will be about the same. 
So I don't have to worry that the dogs in one group are disproportionately bigger eaters because of their base size than dogs in any other group. And that's what matching is good for. And we tend to do matching when our sample is relatively small and we're not confident that straight up random assignment with no assistance will distribute things like weight or other threat variables evenly across the conditions. Random assignment will distribute lots of things for us, but when samples are small, it's not as effective. Does anybody have any questions about that? Does it make sense, the difference? subjects designs. Our number one challenge, biggest, biggest challenge, I'm going to say this to you over and over and over during this semester, so don't forget this. 100% guarantee there will be a test question about this. Okay. What's the number one challenge when we're doing a between subjects design? And it is to create groups that are similar enough to compare statistically. If I'm creating groups, that I'm going to compare, groups that do not overlap in membership, in order to be confident that it's my manipulation and not something else that causes change in the dependent variable, I need those groups to be as much alike in every way possible except for my manipulation. So the number one challenge of a between subjects design is creating groups that are similar enough to compare in some meaningful way. In this class, typically that means in a statistical way, where if I get a statistical difference, it actually means something. Now, the challenge here is individual differences. When you have groups made up of totally different members, each one of those members comes in with his, her, or their own combination of experiences, memories, beliefs, attitudes, judgments, stereotypes, biases, loves, hates, everything. They are at an individual, unique. And so all of those things contribute to differences. So some things we can't control. And I can't control all my subjects and personal history. But I can try and control something by using random assignment. When I use random assignment, if the sample I'm working from is large enough, it will typically distribute individual differences pretty evenly across the conditions. That's why we like random assignment. Kind of pull the researcher choice out of it, let, let the statistics work for you. Okay? Let the probability work for you and distribute those individual differences across conditions. Now, that's great if you have a really big sample. And the bigger the sample is, the better off you are, and the more likely you are to get individual differences evenly distributed across the conditions. Now, it doesn't guarantee that that's the case, because random assignment can result in non-equivalent groups, or groups that aren't very similar. Because sometimes random assignment randomly puts all the fat dogs in one category. That's possible. Okay. So the bigger the sample is, the less likely that is to happen, but it's never totally impossible. So there's some other things we can do. I mean, matching is one thing that we do to try and improve the ability of random assignment to distribute things across conditions. Another thing we can do is something called restriction. Specifically, restricting the range of variation. Um, so, for example, let's say that I'm doing a study here at Georgia State, and you know, we think about the range of the age range of students at Georgia State in undergrad. It goes from 18 all the way up to like 80. It's a pretty wide range of people who go to undergraduate courses at Georgia State. Now, if I'm doing a study that requires my subjects to play Dance Dance Revolution so that I can gather data from them. 
or to play Walking Dead, the video game Walking Dead. Wouldn't that be fun? Now, you guys might be like, that sounds fun. Okay? People between the ages of 18 and 25 are way more likely to think that doing those things are fun than somebody who's 80. Okay? It's also true that there are many fewer people in the older age range of the Georgia State than there are in the younger age range. So it's going to be hard. I might get just one 80-year-old who volunteers. And it's really impossible to evenly distribute one 80-year-old across different conditions. That's called murder, and we don't do that. Okay? Chopping them up and dividing them across conditions, that would be bad. Okay? Plus, it's really hard for them to do Dance Dance Revolution in their own park. So that's not good. So instead, what we can do is restrict the range of variation. And I can say, all right, so for the purposes of this study, I'm going to have students between the ages of 18 and 24. And by doing that, yes, I'm, I'm reducing the likelihood that I won't get nice even age variation, but I still am allowing for some age variation. Now, when I do that, I reduce the external validity of my study, right? Because I'm not including the full range of age from the population. But it's also true that the majority of the population that I'm looking at, college students, are between the ages of 18 and 24. So I'm looking at the biggest group. And by restricting the range of age variation, yes, I'm limiting the external validity of my study. It's not going to generalize to the whole population of undergraduates. But I'm increasing the likelihood that the average age of the students in the different conditions in my study is going to be about the same because I don't have any of these extreme group members. Does that make sense? So if I'm worried that random assignment isn't going to work well because my sample is relatively small, sample of like I have a convenient sample or whatever else, then I can do things like restrict the range of variation or engage in a matching procedure in order to improve the chances of random assignment doing its job. Because ultimately, my goal is to make those groups as similar as I can so that whatever my manipulation is, that's the difference between them. Does anybody have any questions about that? Are we cool with that? Okay. I want to stop there because it says 245 on here. And we will start with.